workshop. Welcome to our online workshop. Today we'll be discussing how to manage the online teaching workload. My name is Amanda Smothers. I'm the teaching and learning coordinator in CIDL. Um, and I work, um, or I've been with the uh, CIDL for the past three years. Um, and I've been teaching college English for about 14 years now. Um, I've taught face-to-face, -face, hybrid, online courses. Um, so I have a you know, range of modality experiences there. Um, so let's get to know everyone who's here in the text chat. If you can, tell us your department or division. What's your online teaching experience? Um, if you um, have a preferred name that's different than the name that shows up when you uh, joined, then please feel free to provide that as well. And you can also share if you'd like um, anything that you'd like to get out of today's workshop, you know, reasons why you decided to, to take this workshop today. All right, so we have you know, a variety here with um, disciplines, music, nursing, accountancy, um, online teaching, online hybrid in classes and piano lessons, um, have taught in the clinical setting, online and the lab setting, um, online teaching since spring of 2020, um, which I think is you know common that a lot of our faculty uh, and TAs at NIU, their first uh, online teaching experience was uh, the start of the pandemic. So more relevant than ever. And I think we're moving towards offering more classes um, online, depending on student demand and faculty willingness. All right, great. Thank you all for posting um, some introductions to yourselves. And if you didn't get a chance to do that yet, please feel free to do that still. Um, so today we're going to discuss a few aspects of online teaching workload, including course design, course delivery, and grading. Uh, whether you've designed the course, or you're preparing to design a course, or the course was designed by someone else and you're teaching the course that somebody else designed, you can all take away some useful tips today for how to manage your workload at various steps in the online teaching process. So in this workshop, we're going to be exploring some practical strategies for how to keep up with our online course, which is seems like it's always on. Um, and so sometimes we might feel that we have to be always on. Um, but I'll be sharing some tips for how to save some time in the course design and delivery and for how to increase your efficiency in online teaching. So the three main sections of today's workshop are tips on course design, course delivery, and grading. We will discuss each of these topics individually, but we're going to begin with course design uh, because that is kind of the very first step when we're teaching an online course. We have to design the course first. So course design is what happens before our course goes live to students, before we open it up to students. And that's the legwork that we do to plan and to set up our course in the best way possible so that students can find course content easily. We want our course to be challenging in on the course concepts that they're learning and they, we want their learning to be challenging.
but we don't want them to be challenged by the logistics of finding things in our course. Um, so that's not the kind of rigor that we want in our courses, like playing uh, a game of, of hide and seek with the course content and, and assignments. So there are a few different ways that we can save ourselves time during the course design process. Um, one of them is to use existing learning resources. Uh, NIU has come a really long way with increasing and improving access to affordable course materials for students. Our textbook affordability task force has created resources for NIU faculty that illustrates the impact of expensive textbooks on students, and that resource includes ways to discover high quality, low cost, or free alternatives to textbooks. Um, so I'm going to share in the chat here uh, a link to the library's textbook affordability guide for faculty. Thank you. Uh, so we've got someone from the Center for Nonprofit and NGO Studies taught online in the pandemic. We'll be teaching online this summer. Great. I'm just double checking these uh, links that I have here to make sure that they are. Let's see, lip guys. So, so let me, because um, they change these links all the time. So every time I have to. <laughs> get a new link here. Um, here we go. So we've got a much more streamlined link. Um, it's basically with the libguides.niu.edu slash OER. And that will give you a lot of information on OER which is Open Educational Resources. Um, there's a guide there for faculty on how to choose accessible course text so that all students are able to access your course materials. Um, some Open Educational Resources or OERs linked in the library website include Merlot, Open Textbook Library, OER Commons. There are several other linked options as well. Um, you can also do things like add a course reserve copy of your textbook to the library so that students who can't afford the textbook could go there to complete their assignments. Um, you can do um, uh, electronic textbooks um, and have them through the library on reserve as well. Um, you know, it just depends on the, the type of license that the library gets, depends on um, how expensive the textbook is, what types of licenses are available. Um, so it might be a one person at a time um, ebook license um, that you can use or there might be, you know, unlimited. It just depends on the textbook and um, the cost as well, how many students are going to be using it, um, you know, whether you're going to be using it, you know, for semesters to come. Um, you can also, so you can provide, like, as I said, a, a desktop -y, desk copy um, or a reserve copy of a physical textbook or an electronic textbook, um, you can provide a copy, uh, like a desk copy uh, provided by the academic publisher to the library for reserve um, or request that the library purchase the textbook. You can keep, you know, extra copies of the textbook to loan out to students. Um, you know, if you have to have a textbook that's, that it has cost. Um, otherwise, I definitely recommend looking into, you know, what are some some low or no cost alternatives to the traditional textbooks that we have been using. Um, and just as a side note, the library is particularly interested in high price textbooks or items that are for high enrollment courses. Um, so those are the ones that they're going to be more likely to to invest in. Um, but OER uh, is taking a kind of a next step at NIU in that there will be um, some indication within my NIU at the point of registration um, for students so that they know which courses are low or no cost as well. So that's another incentive for us to maybe adopt some low and no cost textbooks. Uh, another way to do that would be to use a previous uh, edition of a textbook so that students could, for example, get it on Amazon Marketplace. Um, for a reduced cost or to order, you know, through the tech, through the um, through the bookstore, order the newest edition, but have the older edition and know the differences between the two. Allow the stu students to use the older edition of the textbook. Um, I've done this in my classes where I, I accept 
either the current edition or the previous edition of the textbook. And I have page numbers and chapter numbers for assignments for each edition within my course schedule so that regardless of which uh, of the two editions students choose to use, they have that information there. Um, but I can't, I couldn't, you can't order previous editions for um, the bookstore, um, at least at the institutions where I teach. So, you know, I have to order the newest edition, but so, so that also assists students who require uh, the use of financial aid um, and they have to buy things through the bookstore. So I'm going to keep in mind all of those different things. Um, another way to manage your workload is to just stay organized. And that'll be especially helpful as you create content and assessments for your course before you begin developing your course uh, on Blackboard. So develop whatever effective system for organizing your course files looks like to you. Make sure that you back up your work, just like we tell our students to do, just in case. Um, and I save my teaching files in Google Drive. I used to save them on a flash drive, but um, unfortunately, I had one that corrupted at some point and I lost a lot of work. So I save them to a cloud now, um, but you can save wherever is most convenient for you, your NIU OneDrive account, for example. By organizing your files, um, you'll avoid having to search around for the right files when it comes time to add them to your Blackboard course. And you can even add your uh, links to your files to your Blackboard course um, uh, from your OneDrive instead of having to upload all of those files. Um, so you can share them using a link with that um, OneDrive integration in Blackboard, which is getting some improvements um, coming up. So um, in these examples, um, I created a folder for a course I'm going to teach. Then I've added folders for each week of the course, or you could use units or modules or some other labeling system, depending on how you want to set up your course. Um, within each subfolder, I would save documents like my weekly announcement, my readings, um, any assignments that I'm gonna create a document with maybe my quiz or my test questions, which could help me ensure that tests and quiz, quizzes are balanced or cover sufficient information or even as a backup. Um, if you have links to sources that you, you could create a Word document, just something basic or a OneNote document with a list of those links to save and share with your students, or you could use an external site like Digo or Evernote. Um, you could also create a class notebook in your NIU Office 365 account, which you can then share with your students. Um, that's a great way to involve students. Um, you can also allow students to share links or resources that they find helpful or useful within that class notebook. Um, you can create a collaboration space where you and your students can add and edit content and all students can view all of the content. And you can also create a content library where you as the teacher can add resources that the students can view but can't edit or add to. Um, and you can create individual student notebooks, which are private spaces for each student to add content so that no other student can view it, but you can also add content to a student's notebook. So for example, if you think an individual student could benefit from an additional resource, um, you could add that to her student notebook and nobody else would be able to see that content but her. So you can individualize um, your feedback or your teaching in that way. So this is always also a great way to involve students by having them you know, share links or, or resources that they find helpful um, within that notebook so this is you know setting up the collaboration space where you can all add content together um, so that's one way to organize those important links but there are many ways and you'll find one that works for you another strategy for managing your workload is to um, finalize one module first before moving on to the next module or unit or week by focusing on one module first and then trying to perfect that organization as much as possible, you could then use that module as a template for the rest of your course modules. Um, the module that you choose to build out first should be one that represents the structure of most of the rest of your course modules. So it might not work to create and build module one first because that might be more of an introduction to show the course or introduction to the course and might not follow the structure or organization of the subsequent modules. So I would just recommend building out a module that you think will have a good structure that you can base your content rich modules on. So this organizer looks similar to the folder, folder structure for saving your files that we just went through 
Um, so from left, you might begin with weaker module that your students will click on to get your content. And then the next level would be the different sections of that module, such as the lesson, reading, quiz, discussion board assignments. So that's where you're going to think about how you want each module organized and stay consistent with that organization so that students find it easy to follow your course. And then finally, you're in including any secondary links to actual assessments and discussions. So this organization, three level organization, is going to work for original course view. Um, Ultra course view is a little bit different for now um, in that there are, I think at the current moment there are only two levels of folders instead of the infinite levels that you can create in the original course view. That is changing soon. They're increasing the number of uh, levels of folders, I think two, three, or four. Um, so the, the purpose of limiting the number of levels of folders that we put into our courses um, or at least the effect of it is to make us more aware of how we're organizing our courses, how easy we're making it for students to find course content. Um, so we want to be intentional about how we organize our content um, and not nest content in folder upon folder upon folder upon folder and make it like an Easter egg hunt to try to find the content. Um, we want students to find the content easily um, and then spend their effort on engaging with that content and learning. Um, so you can create a template for your modules that you use to make sure you remain consistent in how you set up each module or week of the course. Um, so this example template outlines the sections of the course in a consistent order, and then you can fill it in with details for each module as you're planning your course. You don't have to show the document to students, but it's a good idea to just create that consistent template for yourself, um, or especially if you're designing a course that others will be teaching so that they know the organization of the course. So that's going to ensure that other faculty who teach the course will be able to understand how it's set up and they'll have a consistent course structure from which to teach. So I mentioned that at the time there's only two levels of folders in Ultra, um, but that, that that will eventually change. Um, so you would create a learning module first. Um, and then you would create two levels within that learning module. Um, so a folder and then the folder contents. So here's just how maybe a week one might be set up in the course. Um, and I've created week one above the welcome section so that students don't have to scroll down. That's one of the, the things with, um, with ultra course view is that um, it's kind of like a new, like a feed, like a social media feed kind of style. Um, so, Students are going to have to scroll down to find the most current content uh, if you keep all of that content visible to them. So it's right at the top. It's convenient for them to access. You won't get emails or calls asking where to find this week's lessons or assignments unless you forget to make that content available. Um, I usually try to set up all of my content to open on specific days when you know that week or that module opens. Um, and I tend to open it a couple of days before the module begins so that students can preview what's coming up, especially if they have something due earlier on in that week. Um, so that kind of uh, upside down structure um, is very helpful if you're going to keep those weekly modules open past that week. Um, so, you know, week one, week two, week three. So just set it up so that each one of those weeks opens and then it'll automatically appear at the top of the list so students don't have to scroll down. Um, if you're going to be closing your modules at a certain date, that might not be as important uh, because students won't be able to see the modules that have been uh, made unavailable to them. So just something to keep in mind. Um, the next way to save some time would be to provide students with specific instructions for what you want them to do. It could be expectations for assignments, um, such as this example here, which are some instructions for discussions, or they could be instructions for how to use specific course tools, like the if you're using O365 class notebook, um, or if you're using Digo or uh, Hypothesis or you know anything like that. Um, providing specific instructions helps reduce student questions and instructor instructor intervention. So you're not spending the time trying to intervene, answering student questions about where to find information, how to use this instructional tool, because you've given them that, that um, 
information already. And I definitely recommend giving the information in multiple ways. So put it in writing, but also maybe do a tutorial video uh, that you can post through Kaltura and share in your class um, so that, you know, if the student sees a bunch of text and they're just going to kind of glaze over, maybe they'll be more likely to watch a video that shows them how to do it, or maybe they can't really conceptualize what you're saying to do in the in the text that you've written, the, the um, alphabetic text instructions, and they need that extra visual to, to figure out what it is you're talking about um, and how to do certain things. So have those ready-made instructions, particularly for course tools of technology, but also for things that students are going to have to do, um, you know, what are your expectations for discussion board participation? What are your expectations for late work? Um, so make sure that you're being very explicit with that, providing that information and reminding students of where that information is regularly. Um, so when you're teaching your online course again, you can make that process quicker by batch editing your course content in the ultra course view. It'll help you update your availability and due dates for your courses. You can change dates by a certain number of days or by entering the current or previous start date and then the new semester start date. And then that'll automatically update your course dates by that number of days. So it'll make it a little bit easier. You can tweak those, those uh, dates after that, but you won't have to click back through or click forward um, through the calendar icon to be able to find the current dates. Um, you'll still need to go in, obviously, and check the dates, make some adjustments based on breaks. So, for example, if you're moving from fall to spring, you'll have to adjust for um, Thanksgiving break versus spring break. But it'll just kind of help you get your dates at least in the vicinity for the new semester of teaching. Um, you can also use the batch edit to update availability um, by making certain content items hidden from or visible to students. Um, so in original course view, which again, we're uh, phasing out at the end of 2023, um, but until then, you can use it. You would use the date management course tool to adjust content dates by a certain number of days or by using the course start date to adjust your course, course dates relative to that new start date. So I'll pause briefly just in case anyone has something to share um, and feel free to continue sharing even if, if I move on. Um, so if you have something to share about your approaches or experiences with designing a course in Blackboard, please feel free to post it to the chat there and I can address it um, before we move on to course delivery techniques. So let's pause for a few seconds in case you have anything. All right, I will keep moving on in the interest of time, but I will address your comments as I see them coming in if they do. Um, so let's talk about a course delivery next. Oh, great. So you, you caught taught courses online that were designed to be in person. So this is their first time actually thinking about online course design. Um, and something that I do recommend is we have an online course design academy uh, OCDA that we offer usually in the summer. Um, I'm not sure what our plans are. I, I can get information about that uh, in follow-up email. Yeah, go ahead. Anyone needed to, wanted to say something? You can unmute, unmute yourself if you want. No? Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll give you information too about, you know, online course design in my follow up. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a great point. You know, teaching courses online that were designed to be in person and trying to pivot is definitely different than, you know, really thinking about online course design as its own modality and how you might teach most effectively 
uh, in that modality. Thank you for that point. Um, so when you're delivering the course, that's when you're actually teaching the course. It's live. You want to make sure that you provide students with enough information that they can get started in the course successfully without you being bogged down with a lot of student questions about how to navigate the course. We want to provide students with welcome instructions or a getting started section that should be readily, vis readily visible to in the course. And I found that, you know, if I post um, an announcement or something that is too long, <laughs> and then I um, now, uh, direct students to the getting started section, they might not see that they've been directed to the getting started section because they didn't read the announcement. So maybe the longer instruction, welcome instructions could go in that getting started or start here section of your course um, and then you know, point students just to that briefly in an announcement um, or an email. Um, so in the original course view, you could change your course landing page to a welcome page or the announcements page if that's where you're getting started information is located. For ultra course view, there's only one page, landing page, um, the content page. So you'll want a dedicated section that provides welcome information um, like you see in the um, example on my screen. And that welcome information provide enough detail that students know exactly how to navigate the course, what to expect. Um, and then you might want to consider um, making it so that they can't access the rest of the content of the course unless they read that welcome information, um, just so that you can be sure that they don't skip over that really important info before they get started in the course. Another recommendation that I have for helping to manage your workload is just to create a Q&A forum in your course that all students can see, and then you can answer questions in that forum and all students can see the answer. Um, so hopefully you won't get duplicate questions in your email, for example. Um, I also uh, provide a little bit of extra credit for students who answer the question correctly before I get to it. So that incentivizes students to check that Q&A board to look for the answer to the question. And that also helps me manage my workload by having extra sets of eyes to help with those general questions. Um, also provide students with information about a time frame in which they can expect responses from you. Um, so that includes email responses, that includes the Q&A forum, uh, that hopefully will help students manage their expectations and not hound you with follow-up emails when you don't answer immediately, because I've had that before. A student emails me at 11 o'clock at night. Um, yes, I, I can send that to you. Um, students will email me at 11 o'clock at night, and then the next morning at like 10 o'clock, they're emailing me again. Why haven't you responded? Um, so whatever your policy is, be clear about when you'll get back to, to your students and then stick to that as well. So if you tell students you're not going to respond to them on the weekends, um, which I do um, tell my students that um, because I need time for myself as well, um, then don't check your email on the weekend. Don't respond to students on the weekend. And then they will get used to that. If you tell them you're not going to respond, but you start responding, then they're going to start emailing you expecting responses on the weekend. Um, you might also want to outline for students how they should be emailing you. So netiquette. Do you want them to include certain information in the subject line? How should they format the greeting or how should they address you in the email? What are your expectations for content? How should they sign their email? That'll help you quickly identify who the student is, who's asking the question, which class section they're in, and what the answer to their question is based on that information. So you don't have to search around trying to find out who the student is or what class they're in, particularly um, that's particularly difficult for very large classes, right? Um, I include that reminder to include that information. So their full name, their uh, course and section um, in the subject line in my um, email signature uh, or actually an auto response. So I have an auto reply on for the schools where I teach. And I say, if you're a student in one of my classes, make sure that you have this information in your email. Otherwise, preferably in the subject line, otherwise I'm not going to respond to you um, because that takes up my time trying to find that information. Um, and that's information that they can easily give to me to make it easier for me to, to give them help in a timely manner. Um, in original course view, you can subscribe to a forum, which means you'll get notifications when someone posts the forum or responds to a classmate's post. Um, so if you're using original course view for now, you can be able to do that. 
um, keeping track of you know whether how often when students are participating in the discussion so you can get into that forum to either answer questions or provide extra credit to students who answer each other's questions um, for ultra course view I don't believe at this time there's uh, an option to subscribe to the discussion forum I can double check on that um, I know originally there was not but you can set up notifications in the activity stream um, and that actually works for ultra and original view courses so that you do get an alert in the activity stream when there's activity in all discussion forums. Um, so you can receive those notifications via email or push. Um, I like using a syllabus quiz. Um, that's another way to help save time for yourself and avoid having to answer questions that students could find uh, the answer for in the syllabus. Um, so I signed it at the beginning of the semester. Uh, I've done points for the syllabus test in the past, but now I require students to get 100% to move on in the course and access the next module. Um, I make it clear to students that they can and should look up the answers to the test in the syllabus. And I communicate to them that the purpose of the syllabus test is to make sure that they have navigated the syllabus at least once and know where to find important information if they have questions later in the semester. So then if I do get a question from a student that is answering the syllabus, I can toss it back to them and tell them that that information is in the syllabus. Um, I mentioned a, a, another strategy, which is to order module folders in reverse, which helps to limit scrolling um, and prevent students from having to search around for our course content. Um, having the oldest content to the bottom and the newest on top also helps you with limiting your scrolling as the course moves on. Um, you'll have to scroll past the hidden learning modules at the top at the beginning of the semester if you have set your whole course up before the semester begins. Uh, but regardless of how you built out your course, you can always drag your folders into this order after you've developed your content so you don't have to think too much about the organization until you've finished designing and building your course. A big time saver in helping you manage your workload is to use uh, due dates and the calendar on Blackboard. Uh, what you see here is a, a Blackboard calendar in an ultra course. You can see the due dates as you've added them in the course. So you can see how they will affect your workload and how you can establish a routine for your course and for your course grading. You can also view the calendar for an individual day. So if you click on an assignment in the monthly view, it's going to take you to that date. And you can see more details about when the assignment is due on that day. Um, I always have assignments due at 11.59 p.m. on the due date rather than at midnight the next day because I found when I had it at midnight, students got really confused about when the assignment was due, if it was due at midnight. So is it due tonight at midnight or is it due this morning at midnight? So uh, that's eliminated the problem for me and I don't get students emailing me saying, saying they thought it was due Monday night instead of Monday morning. Now they're pretty clear about when things are due if I make it 11.59 p.m. as opposed to midnight. Just a, one little tidbit. Um, you can also view all your due dates in Ultra Course View by clicking on the due dates filter at the top of the calendar. And that'll show you a list of due dates for the entire month, which will help you and students see what you have due so you can plan ahead. And that will also, if you show your students how to use the calendar in your course on Blackboard, um, then they can also see those due dates and you won't get those questions um, of you know when is this due you can just say well look at the course calendar all right so the best way to use the calendar too is to plan out your routine and make it consistent so your workload is predictable and you can stick to a schedule so for instance i might schedule my weekly announcement to go out every monday at a certain time uh, i can schedule that ahead of time or log in to post manually each week and then i might schedule every tuesday and wednesday as grading days for the previous week's assignments so i can make sure to keep up with my grading get students feedback each week before they have to submit the next week's work, work which will help them adjust for your expectations, improve their work over time, which is our goal. And then when I'm finished grading, I would plan to send out an announcement letting students know that grading is completed and instructing them to view their feedback before they submit their current week's work. And then finally, I might post a reminder about due dates on Thursday to let them know that they have assignments due coming up. Um, I usually have initial discussion posts due on Thursdays, peer responses due on Sundays, for example. And then I also, as I mentioned previously, open up my course about 24 to 48 hours before the week begins um, so that students can preview the next week's work and get a head start over the weekend. And I do start my courses on Tuesdays. Uh, I used to start on Mondays, but then, you know, students 
forget about things over the weekend and the, having that extra day Monday um, to catch up uh, and remind them of due dates is, is helpful. Um, So once you have that routine established, you can just keep that routine up over the subsequent weeks of the course. Uh, you might need to adjust or tweak the schedule if you have maybe a big project due or during a holiday week, but you should be able to main, remain pretty consistent if you've built that consistency into your course design for each module. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, for original view courses, you can find the retention center in the evaluation section in your left-hand navigation of your course. Um, and that's, if, in this section um, of your course, you can monitor you know, at-risk behaviors for students. That'll save you some time because you can go into the retention center to view students with missed deadlines and grade or activity alerts. So you can quickly contact them, try to help them get back on course. Um, something that works for all courses in our ultra-based navigation, our Blackboard-based navigation, um, is the activity stream. Everyone has access to this. You can choose which performance alerts you want to see in the activity stream, including grade or activity level data, students falling behind or absent in the course, or students who are failing the course. So that's a, a way to, um, from the base navigation, get a, a bigger picture of all of your courses um, and set up those activity alerts from there uh, in a more easy way than having to go through each individual course. All right, the course activity related to grades feature um, is something that's available in Ultra Course View. We don't currently have access to it at the moment, I don't think. I will check into that. Um, but it will it would allow the instructor to view information that was previously available in the Retention Center and Original Course View. So I won't spend too much time on this. Um, I will double check on the status of us being able to get access to that, um, and I'll give you any updates. Um, in original course view, you can send reminders about individual assignments to students who haven't yet submitted those assignments, and that's a great way to remind students about due dates without contacting the whole class, um, including those who have already submitted and don't need that reminder. I've done that before where I've sent it to the whole class, and then I have students who did submit it saying, oh, did you not get my, my assignment? Um, so that reminder, I don't believe is available in UltraView courses at this time, but students do receive due date alerts in their activity stream. Um, and you can encourage them to set up their preferences so that they receive those alerts via email um, as well. So I would I would definitely sh encourage you to um, encourage your students to use the activity stream for new date reminders. So I'll pause, pause briefly again in case anyone has something to share um, and then feel free to, to continue sharing or asking questions if you need to in the chat. Um, so if you have any online course delivery recommendations, please do use the chat box to share your experiences and ideas. And I'll just pause for a brief moment to give you the opportunity to think about whether you have anything to share. in the interest of time we will move on to our next topic which is grading but if you have anything to share um, about course delivery recommendations for online teaching and learning feel free to please put those in the chat and I will share them out with the um, recording all right so grading is the next piece the final piece of the puzzle um, that we're going to talk about today so we discussed establishing a routine but as it relates to grading we can discuss some some specific strategies for pacing not every week will be equivalent when you're grading. So for example, when you have a major project due. So one strategy um, is to alternate between harder and easier grading. So for example, something that will auto grade like a quiz could be alternated with a major project that's gonna take you a lot of time to grade. 
Another grading strategy is using Blackboard's interactive rubrics. Um, so they're, they're easy to grade with. Uh, they take the, the most intensive time um, taken up with rubrics is actually creating the rubric, um, creating a quality rubric with detailed descriptors. But if you do that, then it's going to take you a lot less time to actually grade um, because then you can just click on the boxes. Um, that will provide students with information about why they got certain scores for the different criteria. And you can um, then just provide a couple of targeted comments um, for each student that tailors the information or the feedback to that student. Um, so Blackboard rubrics, easy to grade with, um, just take some time to set up and, and develop. Um, you can save common feedback phrases as well. Um, so if there's something that you notice that a lot of students are um, you know, having an issue with, first of all, think about whether that's something you need to revisit in your teaching, but also you can save those common feedback phrases um, to share with the students that they um, are relevant to. Yes, rubrics do make things so much easier once they're set up. It is just that setting aside the time, and I know it takes me a few hours just to create a rubric, um, but once I've done that, then it's created. I might make tweaks as I grade with it. Um, you know, so I once you've actually graded assignments with it, you can see, oh, I want to make adjustments here or there um, for the next time that I teach this class. But, and I also share those grading rubrics with my students um, because before they turn things in, because you want students to know what they're going to be evaluated on so that they can perform well. Um, you can also enable grading for discussions um, and use a rubric for that too. Um, so I've done that. I, I have specific parameters for online discussion activity. Um, and then I have a rubric that I use to grade discussions. Um, another strategy is using embedded annotation tools, um, Blackboard Annotate, um, where you can make comments directly on a student's uh, assignment in line. So that saves time if, for example, you're used to, you know, you want to provide in inline comments um, and you're used to just downloading all of the student's assignments, printing them out, writing your comments on it, and then scanning them, uploading. I know there are faculty who do that. Um, so this is definitely a great alternative to that. You don't have to download anything. You don't have to you know, print anything out. You can just make those comments directly electronically on their assignment within Blackboard using Annotate. Um, and then they get those, those comments. Um, and, you know, it saves you a lot of, a lot of legwork. I mentioned this briefly, but you can save a list of common feedback phrases and keep adding to it. Um, and then provide specifics or examples and ways to improve that are measurable. So you can see those examples there. All right, so I'll pause briefly again in case anyone has something to share um, about any quick grading recommendations that you have. Um, and then I can address those comments and we can share those as they come up. So I'll pause just for a minute. All right, I will keep moving along in the interest of time, but if you have any comments, please do post them in the chat and I will bring them up as I see them. Um, just to summarize what we went over today. Um, so design and build your course for efficiency. Use existing resources, organize your files, finalize one module before beginning the others, Use a consistent template for your course modules. Provide consistency in due dates so that your students can keep track of those and you will get fewer questions about them. Um, provide detailed instructions for students on how to navigate your course in multiple modalities. Um, and use date management or batch edit when copying courses from one semester to the next.
Also, manage your time while teaching. So help students get started, set clear expectations for communication, use a syllabus quiz to make sure that students have navigated the syllabus looking for answers to questions at least once. Um, put folders in reverse order with the newest on top and set the folders to open on specific dates. So that's less for you to do. Um, that works best, obviously, if you've built your entire course out already. Um, use due dates and the, check the calendar. Establish a consistent routine for yourself, um, but also for your students. Create that Q&A discussion forum and maybe consider giving some extra credit to your students for answering questions correctly in the forum before you do. Um, and use those activity stream alerts and encourage your students to turn on their alerts um, for that so that they make the most out of them. And then finally, be efficient with the time that you spend grading. Pace yourself, develop effective and descriptive rubrics that are going to um, cut down the time that it takes you to grade uh, during the semester, use interactive rubrics in Blackboard, and then they'll automatically um, transfer that feedback from the rubric when you click on those descriptors um, to a grade. Um, save your common feedback, enable grading on discussions, and then again, use a rubric for that as well. Um, use embedded annotation in Blackboard instead of having to you know, download, print out, Comment, co comment on student work and then scan that and upload it. Again, um, be economical with your comments. Um, you don't have to comment on every single thing. What are the most pressing things that the student needs to be aware of to improve ahead of the next assessment? And then you can address the other things later. Um, and uh, also the Blackboard Instructor app is one tool. I think right now they are merging the Instructor app with the regular Blackboard app. Um, I'm not sure what the rollout is for that, um, but hopefully that will increase functionality and um, especially for all our Ultra courses, um, which when the app, when Ultra courses came out, there is limited functionality for instructors. Um, so I'll send you with some resources uh, in addition to a copy of the recording for this um, for those of you who are here today um, in person. Um, and then those of you watching later, here are some resources um, that you can use. Some of these have changed um, URLs. So when I send them out uh, to, to everyone, I will update those URLs. But if you have any questions, you can stick around. Um, again, I'm Amanda Smothers. I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in CIDL um, at NIU. And you can feel free to contact us um, uh, at CIDL, any of us or me directly, if you have any questions or need any help with your teaching, managing your online teaching workload or any instructional technology questions or just pedagogy questions as well. Um, so thank you so much for, for attending the session today and I do stick around if you have questions.